Okay, so yeah, we wanted to um, to spend a bit of time today covering getting started as a new um, as a new Crossref member. My name is Rachel Lamy, and I work on the community outreach team at Crossref, and I'm based in our Oxford office. Um, and my colleague um, Vanessa Fairhurst is here as well um, to answer to help answer questions. So. First up is, yeah, just to say welcome. If you are new to Crossref, um, joining as a member means that you can get involved with our community, connect up content with the global network of online research. And we also have additional infrastructure services that members can, can take advantage of. Um, things to help with research integrity and discoverability of your, of your content. Um, we're seeing a lot of new members join Crossref, and that's a real global spread of members. Um, hence why we're starting to offer things like webinars at different times of day and trying to find ways to offer more, more language support. You can see between um, the 1st of January 2016 and the end of 2017, we had a, a, a very wide um, global spread of members joining us. But you can see um, nearly half of those new members came from Asia Pacific or from, or from Eastern Europe. We're also seeing a large volume join us from Latin America. A lot of these organizations are small publishers and a lot of them use software like um, PKP's open journal systems in order to, in order to participate in Crossref services. There are also a wide community in terms of interest who, who work with Crossref. So it's, it's not just publishers or organizations who would class themselves as publishers. It's also peer review systems, funders, research administrators, institutions, very large publishers or Crossref members but also small one-person journals who maybe operate out, out of a university department. So there are lots of organizations depositing content with Crossref and registering DOIs. And there are a lot of organizations who use the content that's registered with Crossref in order to help people discover the research that's being published. And that discoverability aspect is, I think, one of the main reasons that people join that, that people join um, Crossref with their organisations. When you register content with Crossref, it lets people know that it exists. Registering um, metadata with us tells people where their content is located, and you can update that if the content ever moves. That helps drive more traffic to publications. It means that other publishers can, um, can link to your content using the DOI, and those links will persist over time. And it also means that you can find out who's, who's using your content and participate in other additional services. said whenever um when you register your your content with crossref what you're doing is you're giving us metadata and we make it available to the kind of organizations that you see listed on the slide doi links are persistent so if the content moves to a new website other organizations who are linking to that content using the doi will still always be taken to the content that you've published. They won't lose it or get a 404 page, which, which is frustrating whenever you're trying to follow the thread of research. And the other aspect of linking using the DOI is that it's, it's something that you agree to do as you become a Crossref member. So what that means is that if you're at a publisher, you have an obligation to link to other publisher content using the DOI from your reference lists. And in turn, they will, they will link back to you. So it's creating, um, it's creating a persistent infrastructure so that research is linked long-term. So let's start. 
The first thing that will happen whenever you, when you sign up as a Crossref member is that we will give you, uh, we will give you a prefix, a DOI prefix, which starts 10 dot and then a five digit number and a login for our Crossref systems. We'll also, we'll also point you towards a webinar, which will give you a guide to depositing metadata. Some of our members are very familiar with XML and they send, they send XML to us programmatically. Some aren't familiar with XML at all. So we have very simple methods um, to, to send us metadata, including a web form where you can just type in the information that you want to send Crossref, enter your login details and hit submit. And that will register your content with us without having to, um, without having to, to get into XML. You said the prefix that, that we send you, it may be used for all of the content that you have. One of the questions that we get asked is, do I need a new prefix for every journal that, um, that we publish? You don't. You can add new titles or new journals under the prefix that we've given you at any time. You don't even need to tell us. There are also no, there's also no limit to the number of DOIs that you register. And there's not a minimum number either. So we have some members who only deposit maybe five, 10 DOIs per year. That's, that's absolutely fine. To talk a little bit more about the, the DOI itself, um, it's made up of a number, uh, a, number of, um, a number of things. You can see that the section in red, the HTTPS DOI.org, that's what we call the DOI directory. Coupling that with the DOI itself makes the DOI actionable on the web. What I mean is that when you click on it, you will be taken to the, to the article, the book chapter, the conference proceeding, the data set that, that is registered using that, that DOI. You can see the prefix in blue, which is what we, we Crossref sets up for you and sends you whenever you sign up as a member. And then there's a suffix, which is assigned by the publisher. Sometimes we get questions about the suffix. Um, it's something that you decide on as, as a member and you can set it up um, and you, you choose the, the suffix for each piece of content that you register. The whole DOI together routes through the DOI resolver to point to the, to the registered content. When someone clicks on this link, they'll be taken to this, this DOI. The suffix is something that you choose yourself, although we do have guidelines as to, as to how to, the best practice for creating suff a suffix, which means just keep it consistent across the content that you register. Simple is really good and short is good as well. Simple and short means that there, are less, there is less room for error whenever you're entering the DOIs in our system to register them or whenever researchers are using them to find, to find, the, to find scholarly content. The suffix doesn't actually mean anything you will see that some publishers put things like, in the last example, RSPA is the journal acronym. I can see that it was the paper in question was probably published in 2001 and maybe started in page 787 of the, of the journal. That can be helpful in terms of troubleshooting if you see an issue with, with the DOI, but it's absolutely up to you if you want to if you want to use that kind of um, that kind of methodology. Um, as long as they're simple, short, and consistent, you won't run you won't run into trouble. And there are more details on the link at the bottom of the slide, which, as I said, we'll send to you after the webinar. 
We ask that members always display DOIs as a full URL link so that they're easy to copy and paste or just click on. Best practice is to display in the format that I've been, I've been showing you as a link with https.doi.org. You will see publishers who have HTTP with the DX before doi.org. Um, that, was, that was a previous format which will still work but isn't best practice anymore. We don't change the DOI display guidelines regularly, but occasionally to, um, to fit in with um, evolving web, web protocol, we will make changes um, to, to keep in line with that and to make sure the DOIs work as well as possible as a tool for, for discoverability. We ask that the DOI points to a, what we call a landing page. So a page where, where they can see the full bibliographic citation of the, of the piece of content that they've come to. That way, a researcher can see that they've been taken to the, to the right, to the right um, piece of content. We ask for the DOI to be displayed as a URL on that page and also a way to access the full text. That doesn't mean that your content has to be open access, where we don't, we don't ask publishers to follow a specific business model, that's absolutely up to them. But having a way to, for a researcher to access the full text, either by paying for it, or if it's open access, being able just to click on a link, or even having the full text just as HTML on the page itself. That's all of that is fine, but we ask that members take, use the DOI link to take readers to the page where they can find the content and access the full text if they, um, if they, want, to, if they want to read more. So this is a good example of a landing page from the Optical Society of America. So you can see that there's the, the title, authors, journal information, and then going into the abstract and how the paper can be cited. There are also links on the left so that they can get access to the full text of the paper. And you can see that they're displaying the DOI in the in the correct format according to the, the display guidelines. So this is this is probably what we what we see most often. There are some there are some variations, but this is this is really sort of good practice. You can register all types of content with Crossref. Um, it's not just for journals and journal articles. We're seeing a lot of growth in the number of books and book chapters that are registered. <coughs> Conference proceedings, data sets. Um, we were seeing a large growth in the number of preprints that are being registered with, content, with Crossref. And also um, things like reports and standards. And we've, we've introduced it now so that um, members can register peer reviews with Crossref and get a DOI for, for a peer review so that that can be linked to and cited within, um, linked to and cited within, within another um, research object. I, we do talk a lot about metadata at Crossref and sometimes that can be a slightly daunting term. Really what we mean is information about the the piece of content that you're registering. And that's things including author names, ORCID IDs, the affiliation of the authors, the title of the article, ISSNs, pages, issue numbers, identifiers like the DOI. What we need is enough to show that is enough to uniquely identify this paper as being different from other pa similar papers on similar subjects published elsewhere in the web, so that it can be clear what is being cited 
if you see a reference to a paper in, in another piece of research that you're reading. Some of, our, um, some of our members, and this is something we encourage, go over and above providing that basic bibliographic metadata. And they, read, they also provide reference lists, information on who funded the paper, license information, so um, links to the, um, say a Creative Commons license if, if the content is available open access information about errata or retractions if, um, if the paper has those, and also abstracts and relationships between items. So you can link a preprint with the published version of the content in the Crossref metadata if, if you do publish preprints. Depositing more metadata with Crossref gives more ways for your content to be able to be, to be discovered. For example, funders use the Crossref metadata to look up the papers that we can see that have been, fun have, have been funded by, by them. So they can see that across all of the 10,000 Crossref members, rather than having to go to each member individually to ask for the information. We, t we also talk a lot about content registration, and that is really assigning DOIs to your content through Crossref. There are three steps involved in content registration. Creating Crossref XML, so giving us the metadata on your, on your publications in a way, in a standard way, so that we can understand it and so that it can be, it can be searched and queried in, in standard ways. When you've created that, that XML, you can upload it to, to Crossref. And then the last important step is to verify that registration. So to make sure that everything has been processed okay, um, so that the DOI has been registered and that you've provided us with the correct information. There are a couple of ways to upload XML. It's not that if you're familiar with XML and you can create your own, your own XML files according to the, the Crossref schema, you can do so at doi.crossref.org using the, the login details that you'll have been sent when you register. A simpler way, if you're not familiar or comfortable with XML, is you can start by using the manual web form at the web address shown below. We will send you this in the slides. The web deposit form is just um, is an interface where you can type or we'd recommend copying and pasting in the information on your um, on a on an article and then you can you can hit a button to deposit that information with Crossref. And we'll also send you the XML that we created using the information that you've um, that you've provided in case you need to update or redeposit that in future. The Crossref schema is is really a way to is a way to format your XML so that it's consistent with the with the information being sent to us from other publishers. Um, the main schema is what we call the metadata deposit schema, and we're currently on version four point four point one, but we do support older versions of the schema for quite some time um, after we move to a new version. Normally, the, the, as, we, as the schema develops and evolves, we're adding new things to it. For example, being able to register peer reviews. It doesn't tend to be changes to the core information as to, for example, how you would represent a journal name or the author information. Um, there's also what we call a resource schema. So once you've deposited your XML with Crossref, there are ways to go in and add additional metadata, for example, ORCID IDs, to the schema or to your, to your metadata 
without having to go in and redeposit everything from scratch. So if you wanted to add, for example, funding information after you've already registered metadata, you can, look, you can use the resources schema to do that. The, the slide you can see at the moment shows the web deposit form. A lot of our um, new members use this to, to get started. And you can see that it's a very simple interface which lets you start by selecting the type of content that you want to register, journal, book, conference proceedings. And you can just type the information or copy and paste. It, copy and paste tends to be better to avoid errors into the, the fields below. Any required fields are marked with an, with an asterisk. Once you've submitted the information in this instance on the journal that you want to register articles for, you would then just click the Add Articles button at the bottom of the screen. That then lets you go in and add additional information on the, the specific journal article. So, as I said, the um, maybe page numbers, issue, authors, the DOI itself. We're also excited about um, the, what, we're, what we've called the Metadata Manager, coming so, which is coming soon. Um, Metadata Manager is, I guess, what we would call an update to the web deposit form. Um, it's going to be, a, it, it's, a, it's a better, simpler interface than the web deposit form. And it will also do things like auto-save the information that you've put in and make it easier to deposit metadata for things like references and to manage the manage and update the existing DOIs that you've deposited with Crossref. So please keep an eye out for links to Metadata Manager, which will be available in, in an open beta um, in, the next, um, in the next few months. Many of our new members use the Open Journal Systems or OJS platform to deposit metadata with Crossref. And we've worked with PKP to set up a specific plugin which will take the information from OJS and deposit it with, create XML from that and deposit it with Crossref. So this is the, the page for the Crossref plugin in OJS. And you would enter the information, your name and email address, or the name and email address of the con contact at your organization who should get the emails about whether or not your deposits with Crossref have been successful. And then the username and the password, those are the login details that Crossref sends you whenever you, um, whenever you join us as a member. You can have the DOIs deposited automatically with with Crossref. So again, it's to, to make the, the deposits and the workflow easier for, um, for, for members. When you submit XML to, to Crossref, it, it sits in our submission queue. All of the, all of the content gets added to the, to the same queue and most of, most of the files that you deposit will be processed pretty quickly. Um, so when you deposit content with Crossref, you'll get a message to say that we've successfully received it. That doesn't mean that the content has been registered with us. It means that we've got it and it's sitting in this queue. Normally, a couple of minutes later, you'll get an email to say that, you're, that we've processed your, um, your deposit and we'll let you know whether or not it has been successful. If you submitted something and you haven't heard anything from a while, for a while, I would make sure that the email address is correct in the deposit that you've made, but you can also go in and view your spot in the queue. And um, if you, um, it might be that it's just backed up a little bit. So you can go and see if, if it is still with us. But as I said, normally, submissions will be published within a matter of minutes. When we have processed your, um, your submission, 
If everything is fine, we'll send you a success message. It will let you know which of the DOIs that you sent us have been successfully registered with Crossref. That DOI link that, we, um, that I mentioned earlier will now be active. So you can start to, you can put it on, on, the, um, on the journal landing page. And once it's registered, when people click on it, it will start to work to take them to that, to that journal article, book chapter, piece of, other piece of content. Sometimes you'll get a failure message to let you know that your content has not been registered and that failure message will let you know why. If you get failure messages, please don't ignore them because it means that the DOI hasn't been registered and doesn't work. So when someone clicks on it to try to get to the piece of content, it, it will work. So you can follow up with our support team at support at crossref.org and they can, they can often help diagnose why why a deposit hasn't worked. It's also um, depositing your, your content and registering DOIs is, is great. But an important aspect that we want to stress is that it's not enough to just do that as a one time, as a one time, um, as a one time thing we encourage publishers to maintain your metadata over time because things do change. Um, sometimes metadata needs to be corrected. For example, sometimes maybe an author's name has been entered incorrectly and it's very important for that information to be correct so that the author can, can claim credit for the work. The URL might change. Your publication might move to a different website. In instances like this, please don't assign another Crossref DOI to the, to the piece of content. You can go in and update the metadata for the existing DOI to change the author name, to direct to the new website, and there's no charge to do that. If you need to update the metadata, you just resubmit it. You can, you have to, if you're updating any of the bibliographic metadata, so title, authors, etc., then you do have to resubmit the, the full metadata, either by re-entering the correct information in the web form or updating your, the XML file that you submitted and then redeposit it with us. Some additional or supplemental metadata can be submitted separate. Um, can be submitted separately from the bibli bibliographic metadata. So there are some pieces of information like funding data that you can, you can update separately. For, there are also, um, for things like um, uploading URLs for similarity check or really importantly, URL only changes. So if nothing has changed in your metadata, but it will be published on a new website, then you can just send our support team a CSV file, which contains the DO, a list of the DOIs and a list of the new website that you want each, the new site or URL that you want each DOI to point to. And we can do that in one, we can, we can process that for you to update all of your DOIs. The other, the other, um, the other sort of best practice for um, for metadata um, and the being a Crossref member is linking your references using Crossref DOIs. That means that readers can follow a DOI link from the reference list of an article to the article on on the publisher publisher's website. So making sure that they can accurately follow the the bibliography in order to, to continue or follow the thread of their research. There are some examples of what I mean on this slide. So um, you can see that there are references and you'd, you know, you'd be very familiar with these. And you can see in the first example that the, the publisher has listed the full DOI 
and it's presented as a link. So as a researcher, it's really easy for me just to click on that link and be taken to the piece of research that, I, um, that this paper is referencing. The second example, you can see that um, the, the publisher has just put Crossref, but Crossref, this Crossref, um, the text will be linked via a hyperlink using the DOI, which will, which will then take the, a reader to, to the paper that they're interested in. Both, both of these are fine. It can sometimes be, um, be tricky to find DOIs for the for links in, um, for, to add them to reference lists. And we do have a tool called Simple Text Query that can help with that. So for example, if you, um, if you have a paper with a list of references and you want to add DOIs to those um, for use um, on your, to put them onto your website, you can just take, you can register with us and then enter the text of the, the reference, references in that box below and then hit go. And that will bring you back any DOIs that we can find that, that match with the references that you sent us. There are reasons that the DOIs might not come back for those references. Either maybe there's not enough information for us to be able to accurately match it, or there are a lot of um, pieces of content that don't have DOIs already. Maybe the organization isn't a Crossref member, or maybe the, the, the author is, reg um, is referencing something like a map or a blog post that just doesn't have a DOI. So if something doesn't have a DOI, you can't link to it using that. But for other research, um, we'll, we'll look in our systems and we'll find DOIs for content that, um, that, we, that we have in our, in our database and send that back to you. So yeah, just a simple example. So it's just a copy and paste, hit submit, and that will, that will send back a list of the, the DOIs um, from the reference lists. I guess a few more things just to, um, just to wrap up. Crossref is a membership organization. We're not just a vendor who issued DOIs and we're, we're a not-for-profit. So part of being a membership organization is that we, we need to get input from our members. And we do that by working with a board that's, um, that's made up of 16 of our member publishers. Each one of our members, no matter how big or small, gets one vote towards, the, um, towards to nominate um, for our board. So you can help choose maybe, um, based, on, based on who's nominated, you can help people get elected to the board who represent your, your, consist, your constituencies. We have elections every November, and we also have things like advisory groups and committees for various services. And we do things like beta testing of new, um, new services, such as the metadata manager that I showed you. So there are lots of ways to, um, to see what's happening and to get involved with, um, with the Crossref community. We get questions as well about um, invoicing. So once you join Crossref, we issue you with an invoice for your member fee. That gets invoiced annually um, at, the start of, at the start of each year. For members who join halfway through the year, they only get billed 50% sort of, of the, the membership fee to take them up to, to, to January of the, the next year. You get invoiced quarterly. Um, for the, the deposits that you've made. So the DOIs that you've registered, we issue invoices to you quarterly for those. And we take credit card, bank transfer, PayPal, check. So there are lots of ways to pay that. And we've got a specific email address for billing questions, which is just billing at crossref.org. Another useful resource are our webinars. 
obviously we we can't we can't teach you everything today but we do have presentations on content registration so going into more details on registering your DOIs maintaining your metadata how to query metadata so how to come and ask for things like the DOIs that re that's um, for your reference lists and other cross-ref services such as um, Similarity Check, Crossmark, um, Crossmark Funding Data. So there are more in-depth presentations on our on our webinar um, page on the website that you can you can go and look at and use as you need to. We also have a comprehensive support um, support center which you can go to and try to find answers to um, to to most of the queries that you have. If you're not if you're reading the documentation in the support center and you're still not clear, you can create support tickets from the support center, which will go to our team who are based in the UK and in the US and they'll be able to to look at your query and get back to you pretty quickly so again that's another means if you're if you're stuck do get in touch and we'll we'll, we'll be happy to to help you there are lots of ways said webinars help documentation you can email support directly and then if you've got broader questions you can email member at crossref.org we have a member experience team we've got community uh, community outreach team and also um, developer also a de team with developers for for more technical queries as well they said if you want to find out more about how to register content update metadata or link references I've got links to the specific webinars that you might be interested in on this slide we also have videos that cover our services in a range of different languages on the website. So again, if, if English isn't your first language, we do have a range of, con um, of videos available in different languages as well. And we are hoping to add to those and to the language support that we provide over time. It's also good to stay up to date with what we're working on because chances are it will be things that, that you and your organization will be able to use. If you're on Twitter, we have a main Crossref email address and a support email address. Our blog's a great way to stay up to date on what we're launching, who we're working with, and new initiatives that, that we're involved with um, on an industry level. And our R&D team use the lab site to talk about the kind of tools and initiatives and experiments that they're that they're working on as well. So that's quite a lot of information to go through um, to go through this morning. But please, if you have questions, I can see that Vanessa has been busy answering them during the um, during the call. But you, please do feel free to get in touch via member at crossref.org or support at crossref.org. That's all that I wanted to, um, to cover this morning. Um, if you have more questions, I will stay on the line for sort of about five more minutes um, just to answer those on the webinar. If you don't have questions, then 